The sea plays a major role in the life of the Caribbean, from being a major source of food to being a major contributor to the socio-economic well-being of the region. Every year, people travel from across the globe to enjoy the Caribbean sun, sand, and sea. However, because of climate change, this great regional asset is in danger of becoming its greatest foe. Join me as we take a look at what would happen when the waters rise. The threat of sea level rise is a phenomenon that is related to global warming and the increase in the Earth's surface temperatures. Meteorologists have known about this increase since about the second half of the 1980s when this was realized at the world conferences that were held on climate. The confirmation came with the publication of the first assessment report in 1990. This was prepared by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where they confirmed that the average global surface temperature were increasing. There was an increasing trend that was developing. There was some link of this to the emission of greenhouse gases, and that one of the impacts, if this warming continue, would be a rise in the sea levels. In 1994, in Barbados, at the Global Conference on Sustainable Development for Small Island Developing States, it was recognized that climate change would impact the small island states in the most adverse way, and that they were actually the most vulnerable to those negative impacts, including sea level rise. And in fact, the Barbados Program of Action, which they formulated and adopted at that conference, recognized and had parts of it that would address coastal and marine management, which would include the impacts of sea level rise. We seem not to have learned many lessons from past impacts, and we continue to do the same thing that we've been doing in the same way. In many of the cases, there are no options, there are no choices, because of the limited land area, maybe limited resources. And this is the problem that is faced by most small island developing states. And this is what makes us even more vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change, in particular sea level rise. While larger countries have the option to either relocate or to retreat away from dangerous vulnerable areas, in many of the cases, small island states like those in the region do not have this option. Barbados is a good example of what the region needs to do if they are going to be addressing the problems of sea level rise in particular. For decades, Barbados have embarked on a very comprehensive coastal management and coastal protection programs, and those are bearing fruit now. They have long before even thinking about climate change, have put in place the necessary requirements that the other countries need now to replicate to protect their coastline. But then Barbados have been lucky. Due to their location, they have not been impacted yet by some of the storms or hurricanes, the magnitude of which some of the other Caribbean islands have experienced. Until that happens, then you don't know the true test of what they have put there. But it is good, I know, that they have very good and comprehensive programs in place. If the sea level continues to rise as it is doing right now, then definitely we will need to relocate some inhabitants of some of the islands that become threatened. For example, the coast of Guyana is being strongly inundated and is being strongly eroded. Parts of Joshua and out on the east coast is threatened. They may have to be serious thinking of relocating the persons from the coastline. But at least Guyana has a luxury to move inland. However, other islands would face a similar threat because the sea level rise is in inertia. And even if there are significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, the sea levels will continue to rise exponentially into the next century. People think of sea level rise in terms of a small quantity. So you talk about one meter rise by the end of the century. People tend to feel that that is nothing to worry about. And so, in truth, you hear more about the warmer weather, the more severe droughts. 
But in fact, sea level rise is an issue that must be considered because clearly the first instance is the impact of storm surge. Even incremental sea level rise when coupled with storm surge can have serious impact. If you do get one meter rise by the end of the century, we are talking about coastal inundation, inland flooding, um, saline intrusion in coastal aquifers. And we do see some of that happening now, even when we have a, a hurricane passing through. When we look historically, we can see the changes in the Caribbean region, for example, in things like warm nights and warm days. And we want to think that we are beginning to see the impacts of climate change in them. We may be beginning to see the impact in even the non-science way, so the impact on incidents of certain disease that are climate related. We may not see the, the dramatic impacts that we think we should be seeing yet. I think we're beginning to see changes in the climate to which we must respond. To those who are trying to shift the blame with respect to the problems that we are now seeing that are caused by climate change, I would say to them loud and clearly that it is your emissions that you have been putting into the atmosphere that is actually the cause of the problem. And until you realize that you need to reduce your emissions substantially, I am going to be impacted in a negative way, even if I start to use good environmental practices. The fact of the matter is that it's the greenhouse gas emissions that is the real cause of the problem. The sea provides a significant source of protein for Caribbean people. It also provides a significant source of earnings for fishers who ply their trade there. Impacts related to climate change and sea level rise are therefore not just confined to environmental matters, but also socio-economic matters. The activity, economic and otherwise, is that mostly concentrated in the coastal areas. So any negative impact on any coastal area within the Caribbean, even if you don't lose the island completely, could have some negative type of consequence that you may have to try and move people from those islands. In general, there are measures that are being employed in developed nations such as the US that can properly combat the effects of sea level rise. And we're not just talking about availability of funding to put these things into place, but long-term management studies to evaluate how beaches perform so that the right mechanisms can be put in place in the right areas at the right times over a longer period of time. And uh, that's the kind of approach that Florida in the U.S. has been taking to combat these long-term effects. Does it work? I mean, it's still, it's still a, a case in progress, but it's, it's definitely better managed. Uh, so it comes down to not just the materials that are used, but the management. Barbados views the implementation of integrated coastal zone management as the best way forward for dealing with matters pertaining to development and sea level rise. The Coastal Zone Management Unit in Barbados has been dealing with sea level rise for the last 10 to 15 years. With respect to coastal planning, we look at policies, regulations, development control on the coast. In the coastal engineering section, we look at strong adaptation measures, structural and non-structural sometimes, that would address sea level rise. Percent of this shoreline was impassable during high tide and with above normal sea swells it was overtopping in certain areas. Certainly with the passage of Ivan we saw some structural damage along the section of shorelines, the properties along the shoreline. How we deal with mitigating the sea level rise. One of the things you do is you try to increase the beach width and by doing that you actually decrease the water depth. The wave energy, the wave height is reduced because wave height is actually related to water depth. The greater the water depth, bigger the waves. 
and of course the bigger the waves the more energy you have impacting on the shoreline. With that scenario we understand then how sea level rise actually impacts the wave energy because with sea level rise you're going to get a greater water depth. One of the main results of sea level rise is coastal erosion. We were fortunate in that we were developing an integrated coastal zone management program that actually dealt with sea level rise. And so as we sought to get buy-in from the policymakers, they saw the impact of sea level rise on the tourism sector which is our primary income earner. And once they were able to see that, then the support politically and financially just got greater and greater and greater. One of the effects of sea level rise is land inundation and Guyana has first-hand knowledge of the effects that land inundation can have on a country. The biggest problem with Guyana in terms of vulnerability is in fact the coastland where we occupy lies approximately 0.5 to 1 meter below mean sea level. That by itself poses a significant threat to the coastline. When you couple things like the complex drainage network that the country has, they are heavily dependent on gravity flow. You have a situation where any rise in sea level is going to compound the situation of drainage. The first and foremost recent intervention is probably the Climate Change Committee which is the overriding body on the issue of climate change in Guyana. They have a wide umbrella, obviously. Climate change uh, could be related to increasing temperature, sea level rise, etc., etc. What they bring is, is an important facet of communication between sectoral agencies, and I think that is extremely important. We've had the Civil Defence Commission also being involved in a whole lot of workshops, which bring sectoral agencies collectively to ensure that everyone is on the same page. And within our ministry, there's a body called the Sea Defence Board, and it's really a statutory body that's in place to manage matters relating to sea defences. Uh, one of the, the issues obviously that will come under that is sea level rise. Main contributors to climate change has been shown by analysis done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to be man-made carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases. There are natural causes of changes in temperature, such as variation in the radiation from the sun and the dust particles from volcanic eruptions will block out the sun's rays and make it cooler. But it has been shown by use of numerical experiments using global climate models that natural variations by themselves cannot account for the changes in temperatures that, that we have observed in the last century. Neither can uh, man-made induced greenhouse gases account for the changes. It has to be both of them combined together that will account for the changes in temperature. There are four things we can note with respect to climate change in the Caribbean. Those are projecting between 1 and 3 degrees by the end of the century. We're going to be warmer. The second thing we can note is that we're going to be drier. And that signal is very strong during our rainfall season between June and October. So already it starts giving implications for water resources. The third thing we can note is that sea level rise is expected to continue. And the projections are between one and two meters, at least one meter by the end of the century. And the fourth thing we can note is that we're expecting an intensification of Atlantic storms coming through of hurricanes. We're expecting stronger winds, we're expecting more heavy rainfall associated with the events that pass through. So those are the four main things we see with respect to climate change. It can be argued that sea level rise does not represent an immediate threat for infrastructure on the coast. But you have to factor a couple things into the equation. Climate change, the main cause of sea level rise, has a number of other factors associated with it. Increased hurricane activity, increased storm surge. We're at Caribbean Terrace in Jamaica. And in 2004, 
This location was impacted by Hurricane Ivan. It's estimated that storm surges of plus four meters rushed through this location, creating the damage that you're looking at here now. If you were to couple that with the additional height increase that would occur as a consequence of sea level rise, imagine the implications that we'll be looking at. Not only in terms of the existing infrastructure that's there, but also in terms of the planning that would have to be required for future infrastructure. There's an increasing trend to move away from your usual run-of-the-mill coastal developments such as your hotels and all-inclusive resorts and to go and delve into more high-end types of um, developments that's usually centered around marina villages. What they're looking at is including marinas which um, add a lot of value to the yachting industry of which the Caribbean is an extremely viable destination. As you can see, the wave action on the, on the windward side of the islands, which is pretty much the eastern side of all of the eastern Caribbean, is extremely rough and lends itself to extremely rough conditions for the location of a marina. As such, factors need to be taken into consideration to shelter these marinas, to protect the property that's going to be located at these marinas, the yachts and boats that are going to be moored here. If the emissions are not reduced and abated, and we continue to see the temperatures increasing and the sea level rise increasing, we could lose some of the keys here in Jamaica, Pedro Keys, Lime Key, for example. Scientists are in agreement that global warming will lead to an increase in hurricane activity, hurricane intensity, and storm surge frequency. A lot of the smaller Caribbean islands would be at some type of a threat, whether loss of coastlines or entire islands. The thing is that most of the islands here are a little bit mountainous, so at least you have the elevation that people could move to. But the activity, economic and otherwise, is mostly concentrated in the coastal areas. I'm at Bashiba on the south coast of Barbados. These are normal wave conditions behind me. Can you imagine what here would look like during a hurricane? Hurricanes of increasing intensity with increasing storm surge heights? I wouldn't want to be here. Sea level rise is what it is. It cares not about the developed or developing world. But the threat differs when you're talking socioeconomically. As a result, you're going to see the same catastrophic events hit the US or any developed country where sea level rise would have an effect, but the impact would be greater in the Caribbean just by nature of economic situation of, of the region. The average sea level rise over the last century has been about 1.8 millimeter per year. That could go up to about a little over 2 millimeter per year. The lesson to be learned from Guyana is not to wait until the effects start to really show. We're talking about not waiting until your coastal towns start to get completely inundated, not waiting until the tourists start to leave because the beaches are eroding at a rapid rate to where it's no longer a favorable destination. There's plenty of other places in the world that may still have favorable tourist destinations. Let's not wait until that starts to happen. At minimum, we can really reflect on what happened in 2005, where we had a significant inundation of our coastline due to most primarily uh, extreme rainfall events coupled with other issues related to our conservancy. And uh, a significant portion of the coastline was affected by that. So at minimum, if we do think about impacts, you know, we can start right there. Quite a number of coastal villages, communities, live within close proximity to our, our sea defenses. And um, if we have significant overtopping in excess of what the structures would cater for, those communities would be directly impacted. So we're looking at a scenario where a significant portion of our coastline could be impacted by such, such an event, and as well as uh, places along the riverbanks. Oftentimes we think about the coastal villages, but we also have a number of riverine communities that um, are vulnerable because of their proximity to the channel of the Demerara River and the Essequibo River as well, as well as the Borbis River, three main rivers. So we're looking at impacts on the coast as well as impacts in riverine areas. It's going to be very important that we have measures in place to respond to any catastrophic event that may occur. The islands of the Caribbean do not have a large carbon footprint. And so many people say we shouldn't worry because we don't create that much greenhouse gases. But this is a global problem. Copenhagen 
2009 and CANCOM 2010 were important milestones. And these global forum are one of the few ways that small island states can bring to the global audience the plight that they face from climate change, where they can make a case that they are the most vulnerable. And because of their lack of adaptive capacity, that they will need assistance in adapting to climate change and actually surviving in many cases. At Copenhagen and Cancun, we're telling the developed countries that they need to reduce greenhouse gases so as to keep the level of carbon dioxide at, at a low level, 350 parts per million. In Cancun, we were able to establish a framework mechanism that will assist countries that are vulnerable and need to adapt to climate change. I think that is one of the most important outcomes of the agreement that we had in Mexico. And we finally have had an agreement. It's a good start. In addition to that, a new fund has been established to help developing countries in their endeavor to mitigate, which is to reduce emissions and to also adapt. So those two things are very important. And there's also a new mechanism for the transfer of clean technology from the developed to the developing countries that can assist us as we try to develop along a low carbon, more sustainable, more resilient path that will help the, the countries like Jamaica uh, and, and other small islands. What's the impact of sea level rise, as, right, as I was saying? It is, for example, saline intrusion, especially, as we say, when coupled with storm surge. And we, we only have to think about the Bahamas a few years ago. The Bahamas, they used to get much of their water naturally from Andros, which they then imported um, into Nassau. And a few years ago, when they had a major hurricane passing through, the storm surge flooded the, the aquifers and so they were not pulling out salt water. And that kind of impact will be exacerbated. So the impact of storm surge will be exacerbated as we go towards the end of the century as sea levels rise higher and higher. And that kind of impact is immediate and affects everybody, even though you don't physically notice the few millimeters per year or the one meter over the course of 100 years. I think the local coastal zone management units, whatever they may be called throughout the Caribbean, are doing a, a pretty good job. They have brilliant minds within these organizations that are combating and looking and find ways to address the broad scale impact and impact, impacts on tourism. But I think what needs to be done is, is, is a consistent follow through so that not just the proper materials are put in place to address eroding shorelines and, and other effects of sea level rise, but also the follow through, the management, a complete, we're not just talking one to five years, 10, 20 year strategies and management plans to be put in place to address these so that you don't end up in a situation where you're doubling back and trying to figure out what went wrong. The funding agency itself has written to the contract that we must maintain it and ensure that we have the funds to maintain it for up to five years after we, our loan agreement was completed. So how we deal with it is through the estimates of expenditure every year. We go to the estimates with a figure for funding. Now the consultants who built it left us a maintenance routine, how we're supposed to take care of it, and it also includes funding. The Caribbean government, in collaboration with the World Bank, have established the Caribbean Catastrophic risk facility, which is a trigger-based insurance type mechanism that provides funding just in the aftermath of a major event. And that is one way that they have certainly gone about trying to assist countries to recover from major events. change has an impact on coastal resources, which in turn has an impact on sea level rise. Coral reefs have been damaged 
very badly because of the higher than normal sea surface temperatures. And coral reefs form a natural barrier against the storm surge, against sea level rise, and that negative impact damage that is done on the coastline. In Barbados, the impact of climate change on coastal ecology has been seen through the increased occurrence of coral bleaching. My department, which is the marine department, we have a five-year coral reef monitoring program where every five years we monitor coral health indicators at a number of different sites around the island. Over the years we've been tracking the decline of coral reef health around the island and it's been steadily getting worse. The fringing reefs have been badly affected and the bank reefs have also shown some indications of decline. In terms of sea level rise itself or global warming, it's hard to kind of pull apart the reasons for coral reef decline. It could be a number of factors. It could be increases in disease prevalence. It could be um, sea level rise associated impacts, global warming associated impacts, offshore pollution associated impacts. It could be a number of things. Even declining reef fish can have an impact on coral reef health over the long run. A lot of work is happening all around the world in rehabilitating coral reef. We need to start looking at that seriously. We need to see where we can replace seagrass because the seagrass naturally binds the sand in the beaches, letting them most difficult to erode. In the marine research section, we deal with all of the issues that would affect coastal ecosystems in general, coral reefs in particular. The newest project, it's actually called the Coastal Risk Assessment and Management Program. This program, for the first time, we are not just going to be looking at the issues, the near shore issues, the coastal erosion issues, anything that affects the tourism sector, but we are now going to be also specifically focusing on coastal hazards and their impacts not just on the same beaches but we're going to be looking at impacts on specific ecosystems coral reefs or bank reefs or fringing reefs our seagrass beds our mangrove swamps and the beaches the concept of hazard assessment is widespread we first have to understand the sources of the hazard what are the probable scenarios that would generate a particular hazard so the modeling of the hazard. Then the wave propagation. How are the waves actually going to approach Barbados? At what height they're gonna approach? And for each scenario, height, wave period, wave length, etc., how are they gonna impact a particular coast, particular site? All of this is going to be done under the next project. So then we will have what we call a national coastal hazard atlas that will be able to tell us for storm surge, for sea level anomalies, for winter swells, for sea level rise for that matter, exactly what the potential inundation levels will be for each coast and indeed, if possible, for each beach because that, that will enable us to improve the resolution in terms of our solutions to our adaptation measures. Mangroves are a natural form of shoreline protection. The authorities in Guyana have chosen to use this natural feature in support of their shoreline protection programs. We have in excess of 200 kilometers that are protected by a combination of Horton dams and mangrove fringes. So that as well would constitute what we consider coastal defenses protecting our um, low-lying areas. Because of constant degradation of, of those natural systems, we are moved to implement more man-made structures in a number of areas. So that figure will, in the future, obviously increase as we go along. We're looking at researching and, and doing pilot projects in replanting mangroves. They also aid in, in, uh, in forming a buffer zone in front of your heart structure and uh, form what we call a softer type of defense. We have a unique situation along the coastline of Guyana and probably other parts of South America where we have these migrating mud shoals. So their presence really aids in dampening incoming waves, dampening the, the, the impacts of those waves. For us, you know, we are pleased when we have these mud flats in certain locations because the, the level of concern is less. But as they migrate, you may find that areas that they were previously at may become areas of concern because the level of the foreshore would have dropped 
And so the impacts in those areas will now change to become more aggressive. And so uh, we, we have a keen interest in monitoring them because it really plays a key part in how we plan our program in terms of how we pay attention to locations where the needs may be greater. Ultimately, this system will continue to operate, but as sea level rises, areas where the migrating mud shoals would have moved from will become of greater concern. Guyana is, I think, the front runner of the Caribbean countries in adapting to climate change. They are preserving their forests, which is a way of reducing climate change because the forest will take in the carbon dioxide. And in fact, by doing this, they are able to make use of what's called a clean development mechanism, where because they are able to reduce greenhouse gases, they can get credit for greenhouse gas reductions, and which they sell to other countries. In Jamaica, persons have destroyed mangroves by building their homes in them. We have been damaging the reefs, we have been damaging the mangroves, some of it human impact directly and some of it as a result of human activity elsewhere and climate change having an impact on us because of what people are doing in industrial countries. But in a lot of cases it is a lot of stuff that we are doing here, cutting directly the mangroves that would be there to protect us in the event of the storm surge. In many cases, we have removed the seagrass because we, have, we are trying to attract tourists. The tourists, some of them in case, don't like to feel the seagrass. But we need to start putting those back. We need to then think of how we can now set back a little bit from the ocean so that they give enough space for accretion to occur, for the beach to build properly, and so that we can have more healthier beaches that can actually withstand some of these impacts. One of the first things we did was to ensure that we engage a engineer to guide us as to the proper structural engineering principles when you start to build. And the environmental rules and regulation, for example, the setting back from the high water, which is supposed to be 150 feet. The sea comes in at certain times, especially in rough weathers. If there is a hard structure close to it, the wave will hit against the hard structure, dig out the foundation, dig out the beach, and then you have aggressive beach erosion. There is a saying that the wise man builds his house upon the rock. But you do have to pay attention to where the rock is. Looking at best practices, the heads have established a climate change center in Belize, which looks at things at the regional level, how they can be done, and sharing those experiences with respect to best practices. Because in many cases, it is a little bit more cost effective if you approach things at a regional level. We are the ones who will be affected mostly by climate change, namely sea level rise. We shouldn't expect others to do the right thing and us not to do the right thing. So we too should start thinking of cutting back greenhouse gases. But in addition to that, the way to cut out greenhouse gases is to use renewable energy. And our islands are of abundance of sunlight and wind. So we could become self-sufficient in energy if we made the bold move to change to renewable energy. There are those of us who think that global warming and sea level rise are just concepts, myths. Sensationalism created by scientists who really don't have anything better to do. I don't think those arguments would hold water here in Guyana. We have data that supports an increase in tide levels up to about 10.2 uh, millimeters per annum. That is the sort of change we are seeing. However, in recent times, what we've, we've experienced some strange phenomenon during the spring tides. When we compare the actual measurement to our mathematical model, we feel that um, it is imperative that we do further measurements to see where the effects in terms of um, rising sea level, if it's increasing and what is there. What we've found uh, recently is that from our mathematical model, the actual uh, measurements show that there's, there's likely to be even a further increase beyond the 10.2 millimeter per annum.
The average citizens of the Caribbean must be more aware of the changes in climate. Already we have seen extremes in floods and droughts, and this impacts on them. NGOs tend to bridge the gap between the central government, local authority and the citizens. We are able to bring them together around issues and we are able to source funding that neither of those sectors are able to get so that we are able to deal with the issues on the ground. And, and therefore I think NGOs, whether environmental or non-environmental NGOs, are a critical part of the development of our country and we play a critical part in ensuring that stakeholders have a say in how the development of our country is done. We get funding from various agencies. For example, the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica gave us a grant to produce a management plan for the fish sanctuaries that we were managing on behalf of the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. They've also given us a grant to assist with the public education around those fish sanctuaries. Without that kind of support, we would not be able to interact as well with the stakeholders and bring them the kind of information we've been trying to bring to them. Nobody had really believed in a possible sea rising. But now there is more and more information telling us that both the Arctic zone are actually melting at a much rapider speed than what was expected. There has been no education on that. Not only that, I don't think you can, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. It's a, slow creeping effect and maybe in five years time we will see what it means. You ever heard of sea level rise? Yes. Give me your understanding of what sea level rise is and what global warming is. The global warming I understand is a concern this, this ice that is melting into the, the ocean and the sea will be rising. Yes. What would happen if the sea was rising and you didn't? Let this water out. Flood out. Any of you ever heard of the term sea level rise or global warming? Yeah, we hear that. What's your well, understanding of sea level rise well, and global warming? Sea level warming? rises, it comes from both like the, the climate, like the ice making. After the ice breaks, a certain time it, it falls back to the sea and it will rise all the time and the houses that you build normally are upon the sea level. Yes. It causes the sea to back in somewhere else all the time. Will the Caribbean be able to withstand sea level rise of the magnitudes that are predicted? I don't know if I, anyone has that answer. As we've seen, sea level rise will have an adverse impact on the Caribbean region. What we do now will make the difference when the waters rise. The projections that we have had for sea level rise are way below what we can expect. And the reason for that is that the melting of the land ice, ice in the Arctic, ice on Greenland, when the projections were done, was not very well understood. And so these were underestimated. So some of those predictions of a meter and a half are, are that we have in the foot assessment report with respect to sea level rise, may, the rise, the actual rise may be greater. So we have to be very well prepared for that. 